Today I want to talk about the power of a single story. In 2012, I decided to go to the Middle East to start my internship. And the reason that I wanted to go to the Middle East is because I was very interested in politics and in conflict resolutions. And once I arrived to the Middle East, I kind of realized that everything in the Middle East is uh, political. And I also realized very soon that I didn't really like politics because politics, I felt always that it was dividing us and it doesn't really connect people to each other. I started my internship at an organization that facilitates dialogues between different kinds of people, people from all different walks of life. So the workshops that I would organize, for example, we would have people coming that were maybe Muslims or Jews or even Christians or people that had religions that I've never heard of in my life. And the workshops that I would organize would look something like this. People would gather around in a circle and we would just sit there. And those gatherings, they were not focused on politics. They were actually focused on human stories, on who are we as people and what matters to us. And so for me, those gatherings felt like a very safe place and it felt like a place where people could actually speak from their heart. And conflict and politics would not, never be between us. And I remember this one time we were sitting here all together and it was actually when this picture was taken, it was very silent and we were all sitting in a group together. And all of a sudden, this Palestinian lady, she started to speak. And she explained that recently she had desi decided to get a divorce from her husband. She had been in a very abusive relationship for the past 20 years and she could no longer take it. And while she shared her story, she was actually crying. And I remember that people that were sitting around her, again, they were all different people. They were Israelis, Palestinians, and they would all sit there and cry with her. They felt emotional over her story. And even though they had so many reasons not to connect, they would connect over the fact that she was crying and, they did, and that they could feel how she felt. And that's exactly when I discovered the power of storytelling. You didn't need any other reason than that to connect with someone. At the time I was living in Tel Aviv, and then Tel Aviv is a very diverse city. It's a city where, it's a city of contrast. You have all different kinds of people. You have religious people, not so religious people, secular people, people from all, again, different places, different colors. And one thing I liked most about that city was the diversity. It was actually the thing that made the city to what it was. And I remember one time I came home from one of those walks around town and I was scrolling on my Facebook feed and I saw this page and it was called Humans of Tel Aviv. And I had heard about a page Humans of New York before, but because I was living in Tel Aviv and I saw that page and I was like, wait, these people that I see on these photographs over here, I can actually see them, you know, outside on the street. And, but suddenly I had access to their story and I thought, wow, this is so cool. And I remember that night, I just keep reading and reading and reading and I felt so inspired because I thought, wow, all you need is a camera to actually go out and talk to strangers. In the end of that year, I returned from my internship and I returned back to Amsterdam. But this time I felt really different than before because this time I had a mission. I knew that I wanted to do something with storytelling. I wanted to be able to do the same things that we would do in those dialogue workshops, but this time I wanted to be able to do it online, to share stories online from the city that I was living in. And since I was living in Amsterdam, I thought, you know what, why not give it a try? So on my birthday, my father helped me to get a camera and I gathered all my courage and I put on a really big smile and I decided to go out on the street. And actually, this is the one of the first portraits that I've taken, this portrait of these three guys, three boys in the market. 
And the story says, it was only a quote, will the camera make us look even better? Well, it wasn't a really interesting story, and also the picture, it wasn't that great, but I felt great because I had realized that I could do this. I could take my camera and I could go outside and I could talk to all these different people and I didn't need any excuses anymore because I had my excuse and that was my camera. And that actually resulted into Humans of Amsterdam. It resulted into a project that I was so passionate about and I would go out on the street almost every day with my camera and I would walk around and I would look for all these different kinds of people. And again, I wasn't really good and the stories, I, my writing wasn't really well. English is not my native language. But I kept doing it every day, over and over and over again. And once the stories got better, the community grew. I got more and more followers. And that was actually a really big part of why I kept being motivated. Because not only could I share a story, but other people were responding to that. So there was this whole dimension now to this project. And once the stories got better, we grew and we grew and we grew. And today, Humans of Amsterdam has around 500,000 followers worldwide. So we have a group of people, I can connect to a group of people that are connecting over stories all over the world. And one of the stories that means a lot to me is this one. I met this man, his name is Lenes, and I met him in front of the Rijksmuseum. And when I approached him, his wife had recently passed away. And it was actually the first time that he went out by himself on a social event. And he told me that it was very scary to him because he would always hang out with his wife and they would always go to museums together, but this time he went by himself. He explained that he would see all these other couples and he would feel a little lonely, but at the same time, he said that he could hear her voice. He could hear her speak to him. And when he was waiting in line for the queue, he explained to me he's a very impatient person. And he could hear his wife tell him that, you know, you should calm it down, relax, like you're gonna, your turn will come. And he said that made him really feel good. And it also made him feel good the fact that he could do this by himself. So basically what we were doing, what I was doing, I was ba building a community, not based on facts. I mean, facts are all over the news, but we were building, I was building a community over stories and people could relate to other people's stories. They felt really bad if something bad happened to someone else. For example, when I shared Lenis's story, other people felt really bad for him, but not only that, they could connect to him because they also maybe had lost someone and then other people started to share what it was like to go out for the very first time once you lost someone and how hard that is. And so all of a sudden we have all these people talking about very personal experiences, but in a very powerful way. This is a headline that I found on a website, uh, on an article, and it says, number of Iraqis fleeing Mosul near 60,000. I believe the total amount of Iraqis fl that fled Mosul, which is a city in Iraq, is half a million people. That's a lot of people. But honestly, if I read something like that, and I have it quite often when I read numbers in the, in the newspaper, I cannot feel anything. Not because I don't care, because I do, but I don't know what 500,000 people looks like. I don't know. I don't know what it's like to flee. So the story doesn't have a face, it's just a fact. And facts are very, very important. It's just that I cannot connect to it. I don't feel it in my heart. And that's why I want to give you this example of Nizar. Nizar is one of those people that fled Mosul. He's one of those people. This is one single story of one single person. And when I sat down with him, he explained to me what it was like to leave your country, to leave everything behind, everything you know, your work, your friends, your family, everything. He even had to leave behind eight of his cats, and he loves cats. So can you imagine to leave your pet behind? That's very, very hard. He also explained what it was like to come here, to make that dangerous journey that we've all heard about so many times, what it's like to go on a rubber boat and to cross the sea. That's very, very dangerous. And because I could talk to him, and because I could see him, 
and I could look into his eyes, there was a person. It's no longer a fact. It's no longer something that I would read in an article or see on the news. Nizar is, was no longer a statistic to me. He's a person. And so I can connect over emotions and not over facts. And the same happened when I saw this story. Um, the headline says it's in Dutch, but I'll translate it to English. It says, two-year-old girl from Amsterdam is kidnapped by father. And I kept reading the article, and I found out that this young mother, Nadia, her child, Insia, was kidnapped by her ex-husband. Was, she was uh, smuggled out of the EU, and he smuggled her to India, to Mumbai. And something about it, I just wanted to know more, and I wanted to know what the story behind was, because that couldn't be all it. Those facts, it couldn't be... There has to be something behind it. So I started reading and reading. And so I decided, why not just contact her? You know, we have Facebook. It's so easy these days. You can just contact people. I mean, you never know if they will reply, obviously, but you can try. So I wrote her a message, and I said that I couldn't believe how she must have felt. L your daughter it must be everything to you. And then when you lose it and your child is kidnapped, I don't think anyone wants to go through something like that. And I explained her about my platform, and I told her that if she needed any help or I could help her share the story, she could contact me. And she replied, and one month later we sat down. And I remember she invited me to her home, and we sat there for three hours. And she just kept talking and explained what happened. She explained that she had been in a very abusive relationship for a few years, emotionally and physically. And she explained that she felt ashamed. She felt ashamed because she was a highly educated woman. And she felt that it wasn't possible for a highly educated woman to be treated like that by a man. So she never dared to really express herself. But then, one day she did decide to file for divorce. She decided that enough was enough. And so what happened was her life became a living hell. It became a nightmare. From that moment, she received death threats by her ex-husband. She was even uh, tracked and traced and saw stalked. GPS trackers were placed under her car. Her life was a hell. Until the 29th of September, and then was when everything got even worse. She was driving on the highway when all of a sudden she received a phone call from her nephew. And he was crying and he explained that Insia was kidnapped. Two, three men barged into her mother's home, so Nadia's mother's home, and they taken away the child, the two-year-old girl. And she was smuggled out of the EU to Mumbai, to India. From that moment on, Nadia has not been able to speak or see her, her daughter. So basically, when I went home and she explained me the whole story, I just, I needed time, really, I needed time because there was so much emotion in there. I needed time to understand what had happened to her and I felt this huge responsibility. I felt a responsibility to correctly write her story. I wanted to do her story justice because if you go through something like that, as a storyteller, you don't want to disappoint someone. And especially I wanted to write a good story because I knew that only then I was able to reach a broad audience. People need to want to read a story. So this was the first post that I wrote on Nadia. And I felt very nervous to post this story. Usually I don't feel so nervous, but this time I felt very nervous. Again, I felt very responsible. And then once I shared it, people started to engage. And it was a five-part story. So every time a new chapter would be added to the story. And once e all the five stories were up, everyone was responding. Everyone. We, we got thousands of reactions and comments and, and, and likes and shares and everything. So now people all over the world knew what had happened to Nadia. And they knew about the kidnap. Also, we have a really great audience from India, and they had a lot of good tips. And one of them was that we should contact India's Minister of External Affairs, Shushma Swaraj. 
And the reason for that is in India, she seems to be able to work miracles. She seems to be able to know a lot about these kind of cases. So she got tagged over thousands and thousands of times. Everyone started to tag this minister to get her involved. People started to tweet her. Unfortunately, she didn't respond, which was a really a big shame. But something else magical happened the next day, and that was the fact this. The PowerPoint actually cut it off, but we have really like, if you go on Google, you see almost every Indian news outlet picked up the story, which was amazing, because I have a reach to 500,000 people, but these news outlets are huge. So now the whole country, a country of 1.3 billion people, was able to read this story, which was amazing, because they needed to know. They needed to know that a Dutch citizen is kept in Mumbai, and that's illegal. A few weeks after, it got quiet again around Nadia's story, and we went back to regular postings. So I went back to posting stories of the street. But obviously, I didn't want to leave Nadia like that. I wanted to help her. I wanted to be able to continue this story. And so we thought, what is a great way to mobilize all these people and to give them also a voice, a voice to say, well, we don't agree with this. There has to be a solution. So we came up with this petition and we thought, okay, we'll add also a video to it because we need a call of action. People need to hear her speak as well. We addressed the petition to the Dutch uh, authorities and to the Indian authorities. And especially we were addressing it to the Minister of External Affairs in India, Shush Shushma Swaraj, because she again seemed to be able to work miracles. Everyone was saying it. So again, we published a story about Anadia, and this time we had something for the audience to do. They could sign the petition, and they did. In total of 41,000 times, people signed it. Everyone was signing it. People were sharing it. As I said, we addressed the petition to Dutch, the Dutch authorities and the, English, uh, the Indian authorities. Within 24 hours, we had a response from the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs on Facebook, which is amazing, I think, that they would respond on Facebook publicly for anyone to read and anyone to see. And they told us that they felt for, for, for Nadia, that they were aware of what happened and that they would do their utmost best to reach the Indian authorities. Unfortunately, we had no response from the Indian authorities at all. A few days later, Nadia met up with the Dutch Minister of Foreign Affairs, Bert Kunders, and she overhanded him the petition. The petition that we worked so hard for was now in the hands of a politician, which was amazing because that's where big, big decisions are being made. He took it very, very seriously and a few months later, sorry, he introduced it to, he gave it to Miss Shush, Shushma Swaraj. So this time there was no way around it for her. She had to accept the fact that 41,000 people, including Nadia, wanted a solution for this issue, for this matter. And last week when our prime minister met the prime minister of India, he also addressed this matter. And not only did he address this matter, he even had a phone call with Nadia for 15 minutes the day, the day after. It's not every day that the prime minister calls you on your cell phone, but he did. And he explained again that he will try anything to help her and to find a solution to this matter. So the power of one single story is immense, right? We can activate people, we can mobilize people, we can gather people through one single story. We can connect through one single story. And that's amazing. But I also want to remind you that a story is more than just a story. There's actually a real, real person behind that story. And that's why I want to introduce Nadia Rashid to the stage.
thank you. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, um, I would like to thank Deborah because if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be standing here in front of you. Um, and uh, she's been an immense support. She has helped me, but mostly my daughter, Incia, who doesn't have a voice, but Deborah has given her a voice and she has given her a face. And a lot of people now know about her. Um, it's very difficult to lose your child, especially when your child is alive and you know where she is. Um, also, when uh, you don't know that you were about to lose your child. Um, when my daughter got kidnapped, I, um, that was the worst day of my life and I did not know what was going to happen. Me being a private person, sharing my story with people was just not something I've ever thought of. Um, but still, when, when Insia got kidnapped, I did not have any choice. I needed the help of people. I needed to mobilize people in order to make sure that I would see my daughter again. And life has been a nightmare ever since. Uh, not being able to talk to your now three-year-old daughter for more than nine months is something that uh, you do not need a parent, you do not need to be a parent to understand the kind of agony that you go through. Um, we have made amazing, amazing um, progress uh, to make sure that this uh, matter would get visibility and attraction from the right people. And the right people are involved with it, not only that we got the story viral through Humans of Amsterdam, but people in India know it. People all around the world know it. And everybody agrees on just one thing, that this is not something that any child should go through. And we are still working hard day and night to make sure that I would get to speak to her and that she would know that mommy's there because somewhere Insia is waiting for mommy to come and bring her back home. And we just hope that this situation comes to an end, but we r really couldn't do it without the help of thousands and thousands of people who have been so supporting and such a strength. Every time when I feel down, I, I go through the messages and the kind of hope that people give me keeps me going. And that's something that I actually owe to you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>